All right, it looks like we're up and ready to go. I'm welcoming everyone to Thursdays with CSJ. Um, and for those who are not familiar with CSJ, we are the Center for Social Justice and we are the regional catalyst for collaborative police reform efforts between communities and police departments in Southwestern Ohio. Uh, today, we have a special guest. And before I get to this gentleman, I would just like to acknowledge a couple people, particularly Philip and Gail Holloman for their generous gift to start the center and help us begin this work and to the president and CEO of the Urban League, Christy Coons, uh, for her support and what we do. And I, I'd also like to go ahead and introduce Mr. Fanon Rucker, a uh, retired judge, and I'll let him go ahead and say a couple words. Uh, thanks so much, Gabriel. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, honored to be here. My name is Fanon Rucker. I'm the executive advisor here at the Center for Social Justice. Uh, as Gabriel mentioned, I'm a retired judge. I've also been a prosecutor um, for most of my career, or much of my career for several small municipalities, civil rights lawyer, also I'm the managing attorney of the Cochran Law Firm. Um, I don't sleep because there's too much to do. So <laughs> glad to be here and, and looking forward to this conversation and many more in the future. Awesome, and he is my co-host today and I'm Gabriel Fletcher. I'm the managing director of the Center for Social Justice and I am an attorney also with a background in civil and human rights work. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guest today. And that is Chief Tom Sinan of the Newtown Police Department. And so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And with that, Chief Sinan, um, can you give us a little bit about your background and experience in law enforcement? Yeah, sure. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I'm a 30 year police veteran, been chief for about 17 years here in Newtown. It's where I've spent most of my career full time, all my full time career here. I started in Terrace Park as auxiliary, um, came here in 1993. Uh, through my experiences here, I, as you all know, I've seen an entire family die from addiction uh, that led to being helping to form the Hamilton County Addiction Response Coalition. We started with about a dozen members and now have over 400 individuals, 150 separate organizations that are, are affiliated with it. And it was really a, realiz a realization that law enforcement couldn't on its own deal with a chronic mental medical health condition such as addiction, but it spreads out into many other social issues. And it's really a way for the community to work together and work on some of these chronic or some of these social issues that tend to fall in law enforcement's lap. And maybe it's not the best place for some of these things. And let me ask just even right out, I'm kind of taking you back even before that. So why did you want to become a police officer? Uh, so it's naive, but I wanted to save the world. I wanted to make a difference in the world. And I truly believe that being a police officer, you could do that. Um, I had growing up bad experiences with police officers, and then I had some good experiences with them too. So, and my father was a police officer, so I'm sure that weighed heavily on me. But I really felt that I can make a difference being a police officer, especially I wanted to be in a small community because you work one on one with people, you get to know them. That's both good and bad. Um, the good is I'm there for their births, their birthdays, their weddings. But the bad is you personally know these people. They become your friends. So you're there for the bad stuff, the divorces, the deaths, the tragedies that they experience. So I, I will say that in wanting to save the world, I've really learned a lot about humanity, a lot about myself. And you really get to see some of the struggles and some of the experiences of other people being in a small community. Okay, so it sounds like, and I'm going to probe you a little bit to see if we can get a little bit more on your general sort of perspective on policing, because it mm -hmm. sounds like you're more focused on community oriented policing than being in a large space. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Well, I, when I first started, I did undercover drug work. I was a traditional kind of path. I still had this idea of saving the world, but I got to say this too, is when you start off in policing, there is this kind of thought that if we arrest the bad guy, quote unquote, and take them to jail, everything will be fixed, that that saves the world, is you work on crime, you quote unquote, arrest the bad guy, and all the problems are solved. So you kind of start off that way, and I did my undercover drug work. I was on a regional SWAT team for 10 years. I was a team leader, so I did everything from murders, hostages, suicides, drug raids, all those things. But as you go on through your career, 
um, for some of us, you either get discouraged because you either see the repetitiveness of an issue or you feel helpless that you're not actually making a difference. So my views on policing and, and crime and who's good and bad change quite a bit. And really the family dying had a huge impact on me, not only professionally, but personally. And it really made me question a lot of what was right and wrong, what's good and bad. And I like to liken myself to Batman, especially the Dark Knight stuff, because he struggles a lot. And we talked a lot about the right. Batman, thing. but I love it because he really struggles with I mean, he's always teetering on what's good and bad. And is it revenge or not revenge? And I got this moral code I have to stay in. But he struggles with a lot of the concepts of good and bad. And I've gotten to a point in my career where I got to be honest, I struggle with a lot of this, um, both on whether you call it a conservative side or a liberal side. I struggle. But here's what I found. And when I go and talk nationally about the opiate epidemic or addiction, I tell people, I want you to struggle because if you struggle, at least you're keeping an open mind. And usually that's where we can find some common ground if there's an open mind. So a lot of this I struggle with, but I was the traditional cop leading going down that path of drugs are bad, arrest a bad guy, put people in jail and the world will be saved. And seeing an entire family die, having gone through all those processes of jail, social work, trying to get help, and none of it helped out um, was really, I'll, I'll be honest, it was shattering for me. It really was a kick in the gut. Um, and I had a really hard time with that. So it really made me think about policing and what we're supposed to be doing and how do we make a difference? If I'm going to save the world, how do I do that? Right. And it sounds like that you also <clears throat> had a moment of, you know, is this person really a good guy or really a bad guy or is it really a gray area? And it sounds like you had that about some laws too and about enforcing those particularly. Um, so why do you believe that we have so many issues in policing? Well, there's obvious, there's the obvious stuff we talk about a lot in social settings, race, poverty, economics, um, community. But one of the things I think a, what a lot of it comes down to is, and this is more probably psychological, is fear, power, and disrespect on all sides. Um, there's this underlying thing of, in reality, we all as people want to be respected. And I wrote this article um, about justice. And it was a mother who lost her child to an incident. And she kept talking about, I want justice. I want justice. And I kept thinking about, how do you get justice? Your loved one's gone. What would make up that justice? And really what it was, was I felt she wanted her son to be respected. She wanted people to know he was a person, that he meant something to somebody. And I think a lot of times that's what we all want from each side is we want to be respected. We're just not exactly sure how you get there. And I think sometimes in policing, if you feel out of control, if there's fear, you try to overpower. And it can be all sides that try to overpower. So I think a lot of this, although those underlying issues are there, those all need to be addressed. There's still this issue of fear, power, and also respect. And I think that comes down to being human. And I don't necessarily have a solution for that. I know I tell my officers about the badge is not going to automatically get your respect, your character, the quality, the way you treat people will do that. But I think a lot of times, if you don't have those tools, you often look for, I'm going to use authority to do it because at least you have to follow my authority and I have some kind of recourse and I can control it. I think when you see things go real bad, that's a lot of times what's happening is the, the power. And you guys, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago to see Derek Chauvin on, on, on George Floyd. That was the most symbolic use of power, abusing power I've ever seen in my life. And it came down to, there's all those underlying issues, but he literally put his knee on his neck. And to me, that was, I'm overpowering you, not only philosophically or by the community, I'm literally doing it physically. And it really reinforced that, that there is more than some of the issues we talk about. And kind of stand kind of a lot of different avenues. No, it's all right. Going. <laughs> and I, Fanon, I'm muted. I don't know if you got. No, yeah. So a few things, you know, first of all, uh, Chief, uh, again, thank you so much 
not just for agreeing to come on today. You know, this is our inaugural conversation. So it's not just that this is a conversation. This is this is setting the standard. This is the one that's planting the seed for the entire force that's going to grow over the next year as we do these podcasts. So thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. You know, you've you've mentioned quite a few things, but I think it's important for those that are watching. Many don't really know what the Center for Social Justice is. They don't know what we do. They don't know our purpose. And it's not just that the community of people maybe watching this don't know, but many law enforcement who we hope are also going to watch this don't know what the Center for Social Justice is, why we're here, what our goal is, what our intentions are. Because what we're talking about are police, community relationships. And what I think that there's a perception of what exists. And the perception of what exists is really based on our own individual, um, you know, personal experiences and family members and friends' observations. But it's not, and, and so on both sides. And right. so really, it's really about breaking down those um, artificial barriers and recognizing that all of us have the same goal. We believe that we do and working to get to that same goal. So, you know, as, as Gabriel is coming to this role, I think it's important before we continue this conversation that Gabriel, you kind of talk about what we're doing here. Like, what is the Center for Social Justice and why is it even important that, that Chief Sinan is here having this conversation and that other of these law enforcement agencies in our community are engaged as Chief Sinan and Newtown is? Right. Well, <clears throat> it's about building that relationship between community and law enforcement, which allows, as Sinan said, or Chief said, allows him and folks sitting in his space to see community members as human beings and vice versa. And it allows conversations to take place like this so we can put in place appropriate policy or measures or anything that needs to be taken care of to make sure that the power structure that he talked about comes back to a balance or finally reaches a balance, right? Um, and in this case, you know, we have history with working with the Newtown department. Before I ever sat in this seat, they had conversations and developed a very solid relationship. And in doing so, unless I'm mistaken, Chief, that's where you were able to procure body cameras. Right? Yeah, we, yes, we used the center in, in Urban League to fill out the on the grant process for our body cameras. And that didn't just, I remember our first conversation, that didn't just help community as a form of transparency. I believe that also helped you out or at least one of your officers. Is that correct? I, I honestly, I was against body cameras, but not for the reason a lot of people think. I, I came from the days of having cameras in the car and there'd be a video, uh, it was obvious what happened and you'd go to trial and the person would be found not guilty. And you go, well, wait a minute, it was right there on video. How could this not happen? So I had not necessarily mistrust or not wanting transparency. I had this incident that happened in court and I didn't have faith that even if it was on camera, people would believe it. And when you're talking about use of force too, I was concerned about this. When you're talking about use of force, the camera catches one angle and it's like 30 seconds. You get 30 seconds of every person's life, and then we make judgments based off of that. But like we talk about, there's experiences that have happened all the way up to that event that can that that play a role in that or could play a role in that. So I was really concerned about that. But you know what? My officers were like, we want cameras. One is they felt they were more protected from false allegations. Or if someone said this happened, we could go back and review the camera. And there's been many times where that has helped out. But also, it was a lot of, if we're going to say we are a professional department, if we're going to say that we have a standard, then we need to keep up with the standards of the country and what's, what society wants right now. So the officers are the ones that talked me into it. And the center, talking to the center, they helped us out. Uh, and we got the cameras. I, we would not have been able to afford them on our own. And we would not have been able to get this off the ground without them. So I think it benefits both. And when we talk about the, the benefits of both sides, I think that kind of helps ease some of the tension and why we want to do it. Right. And then, I mean, like you said, the standard has been raised, right? 
And then that also allows us to go back to the community and have a conversation and let them know that the departments that are working with us, such as you, they're doing the right thing and they're maintaining those standards or even raising them. And it made me think, Gabriel, when we had the conversations first um, with the center, they would ask questions. Why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that? And I would say, man, it costs a lot of money to store video. It costs a lot of money to have servers. I, and I don't have the manpower to go through every video and edit it. We don't have those kind of resources. And the first thing he said was, we would have never thought of that. So there was no accusations. It wasn't like coming in and accusing, saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. You're not doing it. It was kind of, hey, we would like to see this. What's, your, what's holding you back? Well, honestly, a lot of it was money. Um, these things are expensive and they're time consuming. And especially in a small department, it's really hard. I will say it's hard on a big department. You think about a bigger department where the Columbus, Cincinnati, Dallas, New York, imagine the, the amount of employees they have to have to edit videos, to work through a uh, public records request, all those things. Um, but we didn't have the finances and the center said, well, that makes a ton of sense. Now we understand why. Let's see how we can help you out. And then you guys forwarded the grant process to us and we filled it out and, and got it. So I look at it as a collaborative relationship. Not only is it raising our standards, but it's something my officers wanted. It's something that you guys said was important. And it's something that really everyone won out on it. There was no losers in this. Chief, let me offer something. Um, well, yeah. actually, it's really a question. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that that we believe is is important um, when when it comes to help building these relationships, and I, and I think that you also think it's important. But I want you to discuss from a law enforcement position why or why not. How important is it for uh, citizens to be engaged? Um, for example, um, the city of Cincinnati has the Citizens Complaint Authority. Um, Mount Healthy has uh, somewhat of a newer. Uh, somewhat like a, a citizen's review panel, where quarterly they sit and they review um, the actions of the officers. Um, we're talking to a couple of other agencies about doing something similar with their with their um, with their departments or with their satellite departments. How important is it for citizens to actually have a a, a hand in reviewing or or observing? or even making you know, some type of decision when it comes to uh, observing the actions of officers that others who, who are not law enforcement may complain about or be observing? How, how important, or is it even an appropriate thing for citizens to be part of that process? So let me put on several hats for this one. The first hat is yes, it's, it's obviously important that citizens have a say in it. I mean, that's who you are working for is really the citizens. We can talk about we work for a council or a mayor or city manager, but in reality, you're working for a community. Um, and that community has things that it wants from its police department, whether it's the suburbs or it's an urban setting, there's different needs, different uh, situations, but everyone has what they want for their community. So conceptually, yes, there should be that say, I think, and now I'm gonna put on another hat and I'm gonna say, I think the challenge for someone, some of us in law enforcement to get on board with this is who, who is gonna sit on this board and do they understand all the nuances when it comes to law enforcement? Do they understand what the Supreme Court and what the courts have said about use of force, Terry versus Ohio? Do they understand probable cause, articulable reasonable suspicion? Do they understand the emotional part, the all the nuances that go into policing, which I'm sure the community could come back and say the same thing. Do you policing understand it? So I think it's important that there is some kind of balance of what is the board doing? What are they looking for? And is it collaborative? Often these, these boards and the police turn into a confrontation. So how do you make it more collaborative? Um, and I think it, I think I gotta say personally, I would struggle with a board that would have complete authority and say this is exactly what happened unless it was a board that was looking into all aspects of the police and what is going on and all those nuances. But I also got to say this is one of the things that the center asked me to do out here and I was completely honest. We don't have enough use of force incidents and I put a board together. They're not going to be active. They're actually going to go, hey, chief, what do you think? which then kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. 
Um, so it's a challenge on our end on smaller community to do that. I do think the purpose is valid. I don't think that we figured out a balance on how do we make it more collaborative and how do we understand each other. And I think that's part of the struggle is finding that balance. So I just put on a bunch of different hats, but I think we got to look at it from that perspective because that's what's really happening. Um, there are different viewpoints on the boards. Conceptually, yes. How do you logistically do it to where people feel like it's a collaboration? The community has its voice, but then the police also have their voice too. And is it the end all or answer all? Probably not. But how can it be more advisory? How can it help to bring the, the viewpoint of the community and how can the police express it back? So that was a really long answer to really not answer your question. How's that? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a lawyer. That's exactly what we Yeah, doing. exactly. <laughs> I was doing lawyer talk there. I did that all without a degree, by the way. <laughs> no, it is complex and it's complicated. I do understand the importance, and I think I'm trying to validate that importance. But I also, it is a struggle to find that balance. And I do know it's a point of contention, both from the citizens and law enforcement. So I think that contention needs to be brought out. I think it needs to be discussed. And from like we were talking about before, I'm a big believer in struggling. If you struggle, at least you got an open mind. So this is one of the things I think that all sides kind of struggle with. Um, and, and, and let me just reiterate, you know, this is a conversation. Uh, this is intended to be a conversation, which means it's a back and forth. And so for those who are watching, uh, if you're watching and you have a question, you, you want to engage, you want to ask something either of, of, the, of the chief or of the center or just universally, you want to put something out there. Don't hesitate. There are people who are watching the uh, the comments. And so we'd love to hear if you have anything that you'd like to offer. Um, Chief, I want to go back to something that you said earlier. And and it, and I think it's part of that that issue that makes it difficult um, to, to, for folks to get centered. You mm. mentioned two important words, fear and power. Mm. Fear and power. Uh, fear is, as I think we can all agree, an incredible motivator for a lot of actions that can be deemed irrational, mm. um, you know, in, in areas of, of race, in areas of force, in areas of arguments. I mean, just irrationality comes into play a lot with fear. And of course, in policing, the idea is that there's training that eliminates or reduces significantly the impact of that irrational fear on your actions. Um, but when we also talk about power, wow, that is such a flexible and subjective word that really can change in meaning and application from one person to the next. So how, from a law enforcement perspective, do we rein in or do we uh, exercise properly the power? Well, first of all, what is power? to you as, as, as Chief Tom Sinan sitting here, um, either as the chief or as someone with, you know, uh, 20 plus years law enforcement, 30 plus years law enforcement going on, what is power to you? Well, I would say that it's actually changed and it's now not power for me, it's empowering. How can I empower somebody to get them to either, and I don't use the word responsible too much anymore, but accountable towards either a common goal finding resolution or empowering them to kind of change behavior. But I, I want to, so, but the, the power part, if I don't have, if I don't feel like I can empower people, if I don't feel like I can communicate, if there's from both sides, if there's fear and there's, there's violence on both sides, then that fear is going to win. And then if we feel powerless, if we feel helpless, then we're going to go back to that power of control. And if I'm one of those officers who's afraid, I'm going to go back to, I've got taser, gun, handcuffs. I, I can take people to jail based on law. I'm going to go back to that. And I want to touch on fear real quick because, you know, you talked about training. And there's this expectation that law enforcement is so well trained that we can somehow overcome fear. That was somehow we can walk into each different community, culture, religion, and somehow we can navigate through that. Look, I... I I, my training, where I really became an officer that could work through much of 
critical incidents, murders, the hostage situations, stuff like that was from SWAT. And that was real training. And that was training on the incidents could happen. It was training. We don't really train officers on the brain. We don't teach them how to overcome fear. We don't teach them about the mental aspect of this very much. We don't teach them about how to deal with the trauma that they see. We don't teach them how to necessarily communicate, which one of the big things is listening. Uh, we don't teach this kind of stuff, but there's this perception that we are so well trained that we shouldn't be human anymore. And that there's no sense, no way of making mistakes. And I think when it comes down to it, and I, I would liken it to all sides. And that's really what it comes down to is fear. We're not hearing each other. We're not listening. We're not communicating. So we all try to go back to that control. The thing on SWAT, what was so crazy about that, it was the most uncontrollable situations, but we all felt in control. Mm. Does that make sense? I think so. We were in control, but the situation wasn't. So you didn't find a lot of necessarily irrational decisions. We slowed things down. But I got to say this too, is I'm doing some training up in Columbus and it's crisis intervention. It's it's basically their quick response teams. It's their mental health teams. It's all these specialized teams. And I got up and said, think about this, SWAT, crisis intervention, the, the quick response teams, all these teams that are meant to help the community. Guess what they're able to do from the very beginning of an incident? Slow it down. But what do we do to our patrol officers? We go, you got to go from call to call to call to call, and somehow you have to fix it right now, even though there is maybe a religious difference, cultural difference, a language difference, a race difference. Somehow you have to work through all this. And by the way, you have 20 or 30 calls stacked on you. And we're expecting that patrolman to figure this out and slow it down, which they can't. So I, I think part of this is the system itself. We do a lot of things kind of backwards. What if we were to slow things, had the ability, I don't think we do right now, but what if we had the ability to slow things down on the front end? We probably wouldn't see as much on the back end. Then for now, it wouldn't really come down to power. It, then we would be empowering our officers and empowering the community. So I, I think the way policing is set up, the way that we traditionally respond is challenging. And I think you're going to see a big shift, social workers within departments, the crisis intervention teams, we, the, the divert team, which comes out of domestic violence, all those specialized teams give that patrol officer an, an ability to slow things down. And from there, you don't find that you need to worry about or power, overpowering somebody. There's not as much fear because you feel like you have support and there's going to be some sort of resolution. And if there's not resolution, at least you, the officer and the person you're dealing with, have ongoing support. I think that makes a huge difference. So I think a lot of times we say it's A, B, C, D, and I'm not discounting poverty, race, homelessness, addiction. I'm not discounting any of that. I think what I'm saying is we tend to, to look at that on face value and go, that's the issue. And what I'm saying is behind the scenes, there's a lot more to it. That's the front facing and it's something we need to deal with. But if we dealt with the back end issues, I think a lot of that would be diminished on the front end. Not completely, because look, there are issues with all of those sections from certain people. But I think as a, a, a structure overall, as a system overall, if we worked on some of those back end, we would be able to serve the community better on the front end. Does that make sense? It does. I understand exactly what you're saying. Right. And I'm I want to address because, you know, we just kind of went more over with power, but the fear aspect. Mm. What are some ways that we can tackle that? to make sure that officers aren't feeling that fear and vice versa, community-wise too. I think a lot of it is what we're doing now. And, and I would say that the, the conversations we have, the conversations that we have with the center, and you guys use this word constantly, and I think it's appropriate, is collaboration. There is not a, I'm trying to, you're gonna come in and do it this way. And I'm not going back and saying, no, I'm gonna do it this way. It's how do we open up these conversations, have these real genuine conversations, ask these questions. I think a lot of that will reduce some of the barriers, but I think we also have to figure out how do we support law enforcement to be able to do some more of that back end stuff so they can better support the community. And I think there's got to be some stuff in the community too. I mean, I think a lot of times law enforcement is looked at for the answer. And I got to say, man, I'm overwhelmed and I'm just a small town chief. But I'm being asked to deal with addiction, poverty, homelessness. I can't imagine 
the officers in the city of Cincinnati, Columbus, LA, and they don't have that back end resource, what do they do? I think society a lot of times tells us you go in and deal with these chronic issues because either healthcare is not going to do it, or we don't have the money for this, or there's not enough resources for homeless people, or there's not enough resources to give people jobs. It was really one of the reasons why I helped start the coalition, man. There was this stark realization that law enforcement is not just being asked to stop a shooting, an active shooter, a domestic violence call. What they're being asked to do is deal with the underlying issues that stir that up. So I think we got to, this, this conversation starts here with us. And I know there's a lot of conversations going on with many groups in, in Cincinnati and the county all over. These conversations are all over the place. But I think we got to have conversations within community too, is how can we help the community to so it thrives? So then we're not dealing with juvenile crimes. We're not dealing with shootings. I mean, Fanon, you, you talked about the shootings that you grew up with. This isn't all a police issue. It is a community issue on top of it. I think, and look, I know I'm philosophical. I'm looking at it from 30,000 foot level, but I think this is important because I think it's the underlying part that boils everything else over is we're not dealing with some of these human issues and everyone is trying to figure it out. And to your point, Gabriel, when you can't figure it out, when you feel helpless, when you feel like you don't have resources, what are you going to turn to? Fear and power. Because then you at least you think you have some control. Let me <clears throat> sort of blow everybody's take... mind because that, that, that felt pretty good there. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, man. Um, but kind of moving into a space where we recently saw, I don't necessarily know if there was fear involved on the part of the officers, but a demonstration mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. out of control power is what I'll call it. And mm -hmm. an abuse of it is going back to, you know, Tyree Nichols mm -hmm. and as a law enforcement officer, what goes through your mind when you see situations like that? And, and just remind those who are listening, yeah. what are you talking about? I mean, what, what scenario are we are we mentioning? So we, Tyree, we operate in this space all right, the time, bro. Right, you gotta remember, right, man, you're dealing with an right. audience, man. So Tyree Nichols was a young man in Memphis, Tennessee. And towards the beginning of this year, he was stopped by police. I cannot remember exactly what the stop was for, something like an illegal lane change. And he was pulled out of his vehicle immediately um, and accosted by officers. And he managed to get away from the initial incident and was trying to make it home. And I believe it was at least five officers that managed to catch up to him and they beat him pretty badly and left him sitting up against the car where I believe he died and no one rendered aid, no one intervened and there was a need for de-escalation from the start, but that didn't happen. Um, in fact, Tyree was the one who was trying to de-escalate the situation. And so with that background for everyone, now we'll move on to Chief and see what his thoughts on that situation and what he thought as a law enforcement official. I, I mean, these are horrific. Um, and, and it's a nut, every time I see something like this happening and it, it is sickening and look, Anything I'm talking about fear or power or control, I am not in any way justifying this behavior or these actions. And from a law enforcement official, it, it hurts a lot because one, if I take a selfish viewpoint, let me take a selfish viewpoint for a second, a law enforcement officer, I know that's going to be a problem for me. And even in my community, even if I tried to expand programs, that trust is gone now. And I'm being lumped into everybody else. And it's interesting because we talk about not wanting to be generalized, but the actions of those officers force us all to be generalized. And here we are defending ourselves, saying not everyone's like that. So first of all, if I take it from a selfish point, that is hard. If I take it from this person who was a kid who wanted to grow up and be a police officer to save the world, it is horrific. It is nowhere in any of my thought process that this is justified in any way. Um, so uh, to have officers do this to a community member, and even a lot of times the person is not really doing anything to your point, this was something that was so minor. Um, and I look at it as that was a group of people who feel, and I'm not justifying, and this is probably psychological, 
but fear that they don't have that control and they're going to power. They're going to show the community. I have power over you. You're going to respect my authority. And this is how I'm going to do it. And it's horrific. Uh, there is no excuse for it. You can't justify it. Even if you can reason it, it's not right. So I think we talked about this too. It wasn't just horrific from the beginning. It was horrific that it went on so long. And it's horrific that no one stepped in. And I think that's the hard part. And here is, if I take a simplified view of policing, really what we're supposed to be doing is the right thing. And the right thing isn't always easy, but you're supposed to go back to the right thing. And Gabriel, I'll go back to, let's be figurative here, the Batman stuff. He's always struggling with what's right and wrong, but what does he always end up doing? The right thing. And I think that's what bothered me the most is not only how horrific it was, how long it went on, but no one stepped in to stop it. And it wasn't just law enforcement. It was, I'd never seen anything like this before where other responders are coming and not giving aid. I, I've never seen the watch him lay there and to know that these people, the image I kept thinking about from me personally, it was sick to my stomach. As a professional, I'm sick to my stomach, but then I'm thinking, how's the community looking at this? They're looking at this incident and going, why isn't someone stepping in? You're supposed to be the good guys. Here, if my image in the beginning of policing was I take the bad guys to jail and the world is solved and fixed, how does it mix things up when it's the good guys doing it to someone that wasn't a bad guy? So it really messes the, the entire scope of, of all of it from not only a philosophical standpoint, but the philosophy of, philosophy of policing it is wrong in every aspect. And we're supposed to be the ones that stand up and do the right thing. It was wrong to do it. It was wrong to stand and watch it. And it was wrong to have other people come along and not render aid. Um, there, I, I don't know how to even get to a point where I can find even a silver lining that justifies or reasons this. It, and it should be a wake up call. I 99, like we talk about, most of the police officers aren't doing this, but I do think we should also be some of the first ones when it's so obvious like this, stand up and say this is wrong. I think where it gets clouded is that not every use of force is that. There's some things that are atrocious. This is atrocious. This should not be condoned. But I don't think that we should lump it to every use of force. But when it's something like this, it should be called out. It's finding that balance that, um, that you, again, it's finding that balance. But Gabriel, to, to answer your question, it's sickening to watch something like that. So for 2023, the center has an objective, which is, of course, policy change, but really three policies, right? De-escalation, which was mentioned, the duty to intervene, which was mentioned by you, and then the duty to render aid. But I just want to kind of focus mm -hmm. on that duty to intervene where you were talking about no one intervened. So my question would be, how do we empower officers who are on scene who want to do the right thing to stop something like that or another incident? How do we empower them to go ahead and step in and do that? Well, you know, I had a, an interesting conversation with someone that I admire and respect a lot, who I think is basically, he's my Yoda, and his name's Gabriel. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he had talked to me because I was like, man, all you got to do is have empathy for people and blah, blah, blah. And he said, man, you got to have policies too. And it really hit home. And the reason why to have those policies is because when someone, the majority of the department can be doing good things, but you want to be able to have some type of recourse when someone isn't. So policy is a number is one of the things. Training is another, but then also hearing the personal stories that people go through. And when you humanize it, I think that makes a big difference too. So I think part of it, so I tend to be very much on the, uh, how do we connect human side of it? That's gotta be part of it. That's a storytelling. How does the community, how has this impacted somebody? But then Gabriel, you made a really good point that has stuck with me. And that is you got to make sure that there's some type of training, education, we're constantly reinforcing it. And then the policy to make sure when something bad happens that we were able to deal with that. And really, when you're talking about training, if you really want training to become habit, you have to keep reinforcing it. So I think having the community engagements, having the discussions, the policies and the training on top of it will make a big difference. But I also think it starts with leadership and we have to stand up and say, this is important. What this badge stands for is not just what I personally believe. 
It is what is viewed as right and wrong. And we should be doing the right thing, even when it's not easy, even when sometimes you stand alone. And, and I got to tell you, and I told you this, my personal experience when first started having a different viewpoint on addiction. I mean, I had people in law enforcement who were really upset at me, um, who <laughs> they, they, they stopped being my friend. Um, it is tough in this community, but I would like it to any workspace. If you saw someone in your workspace, how challenging it would, would it be to call somebody out, especially if you could lose your job, if there's rumors, if there's false allegations, because you are going to now be a target. But I would say this, because I, I my personal Yoda, Gabriel, had made a really good another point, is that you want your pilot not making mistakes. See, I actually listen to you, and it hits home. <laughs> So you want your pilot to have a certain standard. And I thought, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. So I do think in policing, we got to step up on this one and we got to say, you know what, we need to call out the wrongs, even when it's us. And we've had it happen in our department and they're not major stuff. They're usually little things, but, and I, my officers come to me and they struggle. They struggle with, Hey, this bothers me. It's not really a, a law issue or legal or right or wrong. They just do something different than what, the other officer thinks should be done that way, but it just gives you a snippet. Here's something really minor and look how much people struggle with it. And our thing is, hey, you know what? At least bring it up. If it's something minor, we'll work through it. We'll train through it. We'll figure it out. And maybe the other person's not doing nothing wrong. And maybe it's just your perception. But I want you to do it on those little things because if you're how if you feel comfortable doing it on those little things and it's not ratting, it is just a discussion. How can we improve? Then when a big thing happens, then the officer will more than likely be more willing to stand up and say, you know what, this is wrong. We have a code, we have ethics, we have policies, we have training. I'm going to go back to this and say, you know what, you need to stop. And if you don't stop, I'm calling you out on it. And if it's that what we saw on some of these, like the Memphis incident, that's completely wrong. And I'm stepping in and I'm physically stopping this incident. Easy question. Yeah. How do we change the culture and and police culture one? But more importantly, I think community culture, not to have that um, 50 or 60 year old experience of um, fear and engagement when they come in contact with law enforcement. How, how, how do we change that culture? Or, or, or do we know a way that we can? Well, I don't have a one, two, three or ABC way to do it, but I think you just hit on it. It is including everyone. It is the complete culture. It is the policing industry, the criminal justice industry. It is the community itself. We all have our things that are going on within our own systems. But I do think that we need to focus more on the police end. How do we train through fear? How do we have that mental aspect? And maybe there's some departments that are doing it. I'm just saying overall as an industry, I think we need to have more training on what it's like to be human, to feel that fear, to understand someone else's fear. Um, I'm part of this mental health training that we're doing, this trauma reform training. And it's fascinating to see how fear impacts people's body, their mind, how it impacts their decisions. I think we got to focus as much on the mind of policing, of a police officer, as we do the physical aspects of it. The more they understand about themselves, the more they're going to be likely to understand someone else. As far as the community goes, man, there's we've got to, and it's challenging because there's politics involved, there's funding. Um, when you're talking about shootings, and like I said, Fanon, you talked a lot about that. We have a Second Amendment, we have a Constitution, and you talked about the support of that. That's challenging because there's guns on the street. There's people, I was just reading an article about road rage incidents and people shooting. It, we don't, if you're going to expect law enforcement to be able to set the bar, be the example, and everything's fixed, it's not going to work. It's got, how do we as a society, and I don't have an e easy answer for that, because as a society, we got to start looking at each other as people. But when we have access to violence, where we're not de-escalating ourselves in our community, when we are not working as a community on some of these issues, whether it is children that are growing up because their parents are, aren't there, or it is a school system that isn't uh, able to help out or have the finances to do it. There's a lot of layers and tentacles that go to it that makes it extremely challenging. But I think the way we get to the, at least the beginning is exactly the way you put it. 
how do we as community, the culture overall, and you are inclusive of that culture of policing and community. That's the beginning is how do we get there and start talking those, those through those issues. And then on the back end, there's got to be some policy changes. There's got to be resources for the community. There's got to be resources for law enforcement. If we're going to teach law enforcement how to more operate from the brain side of it, then we got to do the same thing for our community. You want officers to de-escalate? The community's got to de-escalate too. We all got to do it together. And if we're able to do it together, then I think we have a lot more solutions. But you know, I was thinking about, I'd written an article and it was fascinating that you're asking me this question because I talked about we all put post-it notes on each other. We, we label each other and a lot of it's projections. And a lot of it is, this is my experience. This is what happened to me. I'm going to put this post-it note on it and you carry it. And I wrote in this article that I go home at the end of the day as a cop and I have all, I'm littered with post-it notes. Hero, villain, oppressor, freer, good guy, bad guy, all the stuff. And I take my uniform off and the, and the post-it notes are littered on the ground. And it started with a conversation where someone had bad experiences with the police and they said, I know there's an officer in this classroom and they wear a uniform every day. I had a bad experience. They're bad. And I thought, well, wait a minute. How do they know I'm bad? And then all of a sudden someone defended me and go, no, 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 no. The police are good. They did this. They did that. And I go, I thought, well, how do you know I'm so good? <laughs> and I, I thought about these post-it notes being littered on my floor. And at night, I got to read each post-it note. And then I got to try to figure out who I am as a cop. But then community tells me, go and deal with this, with this community, this religious group, this race, this poverty. And somehow I'm supposed to navigate it through it when I don't even know what my role is or, the, or who I am. I got to go back to the why. But I'll expand this because in the article I wrote, not only is that happening to me, it's happening to everyone else in the community. Because I will go as a police officer, take my post-it note off and stick it on you. I feel, I feel helpless. Everybody lies. Everybody does this. This is the fourth time I've been on this call. I don't know. I don't have an answer. And we all stick these post-it notes on each other. And the first thing we don't do is look at ourselves and say, who am I? If I can see me and understand me, then I can see you and understand you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Chief, obviously this is being broadcast. Um, it's being shared on, on, on my page, on other people's page, Urban League page. And there are people who are commenting. I, I, know, I think that mm -hmm. you're able to see some of the comments coming in. Um, Gabriel, you're able to see those. Gabriel, do you want to respond or ask the questions mm -hmm. of the Chief that are coming in or even ask them for us? Let me see. I'm going to go ahead and pull them up here so I can get a look at them. And while he's looking at that, Chief, um, uh, I don't want to get you in any trouble. We don't we don't want you to have any problems. But there's a proposal right now for the age to become a police officer to be lowered to 18. Um, some are supportive, some are critical. If you don't feel any problem in asking the question, how do you feel about 18 year olds becoming police officers? I'm not in favor of it. Um, I don't think. It's interesting. We in policing talk about not lowering our standards, but then there's legislation or there's some policy that comes out and says you should be doing less. And we're sitting here talking about doing more. Um, so, no, I'm not in favor of 18. It is an extremely challenging job where you have to make high pressure decisions. Um, and I just saw one of the comments talk about, do we really need to train managing egos? I, I don't know if it's necessarily an ego as much as and they hit it on the head. We are taught you catch the bad guy you take into jail. I think we need to have a more layered uh, perspective on what our job is, the why, and what we're supposed to be doing. But and when you're 18 years old, <laughs> look, man, I, I know I look like I'm 25. And <laughs> if, if everyone says I'm 25, no tickets whatsoever. But, man, I'm 55 years old. And it took me 30 years to get in this spot with a lot of mistakes that I made, a lot of things that I wish I could go back and do again. A lot of people, I've watched an entire family die. It, it it really hit my community hard. That's at 55 years old, and I don't have it all figured out. I can't imagine an 18-year-old trying to go into some of these situations. And I not I don't work in a community where there's a bunch of shootings, where we're high crime. I have a, a lot easier than just a Cincinnati officer on in one of the districts who's dealing with the call to call to call. I can't imagine an 18-year-old. I think it's a, a not a good thing to do. I don't think we should be desperate in this little lull that we're having to try to find police officers. I think that we should continue to try to raise the bar and the standard. And we got to ride this out until we can find people who want to be in this job again. And I actually think these conversations, the way that 
we have these conversations. We're not necessarily saying here's the solution, but we're having these conversations. I think this helps change minds and you'll get people who want to be police officers because of the why will change. The why will be, I want to have a better impact on humanity. I want to have a better impact on community. It's not just about arresting bad guys or good guys. L look, there's dilemma in that and it's challenging. But if we always go back to the human aspect of it, I think that'll make a difference. But we got to get younger people who want to be in this job again. And part of that is we can't be confrontational. We got to be collaborative. And this is what I've always appreciated about the center is the center comes in with collaboration. What are your hurdles? Here's our hurdles. Let's work on this. I think the more community and law enforcement does that, the more we're going to have people who want to do this job again. And we won't be having conversations of lowering the age to 18. So as you guys know, you two know this, I'm not good at short yes and no answers. So okay. I'm going to give it a try. No. How's that? <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Here's a here's a comment for you, Chief. It's off of, I believe, off of Facebook. Um, police are often made to deal with social problems while only being provided law enforcement tools. Mm. Um, here's a question for you. It seems that too often the police have a catch a bad guy attitude rather than a how can I de-escalate a situation so that everyone can go home safely attitude. Do you really need to train someone how to manage egos? Well, here's the thing. What is law enforcement? I think one of the things that's challenging on my end, and I'm not justifying, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to put on my hat. One of the challenging things for me is what are your expectations of me? You call me law enforcement. And I'm supposed to go out and enforce laws, right? So if I go out and enforce laws, then that is narrowed down you generally to the to the good guy, the bad guy. I'm gonna take the bad guy because in my mindset, being trained in law enforcement, I go catch the bad guy, take him to jail, and everything's fixed. That's what we are in law enforcement. Guess what we're asked to do though? We're asked to deal with poverty, homelessness, racial issues, uh, drug addiction, mental health. And then all of a sudden, that role of law enforcement doesn't fit so well. I, I, get, I tell the story of the last brother that died in the family, and he had been, he was crying, saying he didn't want to die. He ended up, uh, we tried to get him help. He refused help. I now understand when I talk about addiction that the familiarity of despair is even more powerful than the fear of hope. But I didn't have choices after that happened. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Chief. Repeat yeah. that again. Repeat that again. I'm processing what you just said the, the familiarity the, of go ahead despair is more powerful than the fear of hope hmm. okay if i take it from an addiction level if i go to try to get recovery and i fail then i got to deal with guilt and shame everyone's going to judge me and criticize me but if i stay in that familiarity of despair i don't have to worry about guilt and shame it's what i know i don't have to i don't have to try to strive for something but with that young man, after he refused help, here's my tools to deal with addiction. Gun, taser, handcuff, and jail. Go down the list, none of those apply except for jail. And I literally said this, we got to take him to jail to at least keep him alive for 24 hours. Think about this. I use jail as a way to save someone's life. And he, we saved his life for 24 hours. He got out the next morning. He did what was left of his heroin and fentanyl and overdosed and died. Yep. It wasn't just one person. He was the last of an entire generation, the last of an entire family. So when we talk about it's easier for me, the familiarity of despair, if I want to go back to my roots of law enforcement, is to catch the bad guy and put him in jail. Then I don't have to worry about all the stuff we just started discussing because I don't have an answer for that. I know you guys don't have an answer. We have things that we will think we have ideas and there's things we want to try and work on but that's not a solution i can give that eight, especially an 18 year old or a 25 year old or 21 year old to go out and fix these these issues so when we talk about is it just the bad guy and good guy yeah if you're going to call me law enforcement if you want me to do all these other things then i need the tools and resources i did a lot of this stuff out of feeling helpless to watch an entire family an entire generation was not part of my naive plan of saving the world. It really rocked my world and I realized I don't have the tools to deal with this. So I spoke up in a community 
and said, why are you looking at me to handle all this stuff? And, and Gabriel and Fanon and I'm, I'm eight years into the coalition. And luckily, a community came together and is working on it. We have 400 people, 150 separate organizations. But what if no one stepped up and said, you know what? That's your problem. You keep doing what you're doing. Now we have a community that's working on a lot of these issues. But if someone didn't step up, what do we expect that loan officer responding to that call to finally go down to when they feel like they don't have answers or it's hopeless? Often. I'm law enforcement. You train me to catch the bad guys. I take them to jail. I'm done with it. The rest of it's out of my hands. So you have to change our role and our definition. We have to be part of that community discussion because community's got to do it too. If we're both going to talk, what is my role? And I'll go back to your question about the, the citizen boards. I think really where the citizen boards come into play and what would be really helpful is what is your role as a law enforcement or a police officer in my community? When we talk to my officers here in a small community, it could be you're paying someone's water bill. You, it could be that you're helping them get out of bed. It could be that you're trying to solve a kid who just witnessed a domestic violence and you're sitting on the front porch with them. Imagine being that patrol officer that has 20, 30 calls stacked on them that wants to do that, but can't because uh, they're so under, under so overwhelmed with calls. And then the community puts pressure on them and says, well, you're the cop. You should have all the answers. And then the cop goes, well, what about the community? Why aren't they doing it? And we get in the cycle of blaming each other, but no one's really sitting down and saying, hey, man, how can I, the community, help you in law enforcement? And how can you, law enforcement, help me, the community? Does that make sense? It, it definitely makes sense. Um, and, and, and I'm disappointed because it's 458, which means we have about nine more hours worth of stuff. To get, to get I'm going to say we'll never finish this in an right. hour. I mean, I don't think we've any of us have had a conversation under an hour. There, there are a lot of comments that are coming in now, a lot of questions. Um, like one person asked, why that person that you took to jail to keep them alive, why didn't they get addiction treatment services? And, and what you and I know from working in that system is that there, the, the level and the success of, quote, community-based treatment services are few and far between and difficult to get into or diff difficult to get access to, but you can get it immediately when you get take them to jail. Well, well, he refused. That adds a whole, he refused treatment. We were going to pay for it. We couldn't figure out where to go. We were going to find something. He said, no, I don't want it. Because that familiarity of despair, that addiction was what he knew. And, and I got corrected. It's citizens oversight boards, not citizen boards. And I apologize for that. Get corrected <laughs> on that. But you know, no, he refused treatment. He refused treatment. And that's part of it, too, is if, if you feel you're challenged already and someone says, no, I don't want this help. What do you do then? Right. Right. And, and again, Chief, we're running out of time. But, you know, one of the things that that um, historically we we deal with is the issue of race and policing. And, you know, we, we've seen it over the years. We've seen it in, in the protests. We've seen it in the um in, in efforts to to address you know disparities in, in the justice system, one of the questions that somebody asked is why uh, asked the chief why more black people treated uh, mistreated by the police than non black people. I mean you know just put it out there. I, uh, again, we're running out of time, but but that's not something that you're shy about having a conversation about. I know that because we've had that conversation. It what's what is the specific question in that? The question they ask is, why are more Black people mistreated by police than non-Black people? And I, I'm sure that they meant by percentage, because by numbers, I, I don't think that that meets itself out. Certainly, we know there are more whites that are shot and killed by police than there are Blacks. We, we, we know that because they're the Black population 12%. So, I mean, I'm guessing that what they're suggesting is what they see news-wise is why percentage-wise, it looks like more Black people are mistreated by police than non-Black people on the circumstances that we've seen. That's my guess. I, I, I didn't write the question, but I can yeah, understand. And I always go back to there's poverty, there's economics that play a role in it. There's a lot of different factors, and I don't have a good reason for why that happens with policing and the Black community. It shouldn't happen in the Black community. It shouldn't happen in any community. Um, and I know that's not the best answer, but I don't have a, a why on unnecessarily that because, Fanon, you hit it on the head. Every argument, there's always some study, some research that says this is, yeah, that happened, but this is what's ha really happening. I think it comes down to we do need to focus on if there is 
it's going on in the black community. And uh, we all agree there are issues with policing in the black community to some extent. There's also issues in poverty. There's also issues in addiction and mental health. And again, I think that's the challenge from a law enforcement perspective is we're being asked to deal with all these chronic conditions, these big challenging uh, conditions. And you're asking an 18 year old potentially or a 21 year old or a 25 year old to deal with all these. So it's extremely, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely complex. But I think what a lot of what needs to happen to change is we need to have these conversations in the community. And I know it happens on some extent and it happens with other departments, but we need to keep having these conversations on. This is what I perceive is happening. This is what's happening to me. And then we need to have that back and forth so we have a better understanding. Let me ask a quick question, um, particularly around the because people still ask about it, that 18 year old that you take mm -hmm. to jail and then he gets out, overdoses, generation gone. When exactly did that happen? The, the, it was back in 2014, a little bit before Thanksgiving. So what did the resources then look like versus now for addiction? We didn't assistance? have a coalition, but there was definitely treatment centers we could have taken the cat and we offered that. We offered cat, we offered to take him to the hospital. We offered all those things and he refused any help whatsoever. Um, and he had he had drug paraphernalia. He had committed a quote unquote crime. Although nowadays that might be something that we don't necessarily look at. It was a tool that was he did commit a crime and we felt that that's what we needed to do to keep him alive. So it wasn't a matter of, I mean, we tried social services. We worked with the schools. The schools worked with it. The community worked with them. Um, this was something where when after he overdosed, we wanted to get him help. And we'd done this before, even before the coalition. We drove people to the hospital. We would find a way to get them help that they needed. Um, he did not want that help. And so look, I known I knew him since he was a kid. He actually set my personal car on fire in the parking lot. Him and another kid, they were drinking and doing acid, mistook my car for someone else. I mean, I had dealt with this kid for 20 some years and we tried everything we could and I think what was sad and what really made me think about when you talk about generational trauma or adverse childhood experiences, I realized, and, and this goes back to Gabriel and Fanon, this is what I'll tie a lot of this into, is I tried everything, but I could not overcome adverse childhood experiences and generational trauma. I could not overcome the impact of what happened in his family and what he went through and the things that he saw and the things that he didn't have support in his family. I think a lot of times people say, well, you wave this magic wand and you'll fix it all. Man, this was a young man who experienced this life for 20 some, 30 some years. And then he overdoses and we've tried everything. We'll drive you to the hospital. We'll, we'll find treatment for you. We'll pay for it. And he sits there and says, no. But then I just had a conversation with an officer today. We had lunch and they were talking about, why can't we do involuntary commitment? I've tried to do that. I've tried to work on a law with that, but then I get pushed back from harm reduction. I get pushed back from attorneys who say, wait a minute, you as a police officer can't probate somebody. You shouldn't be taking them off the street. So it, and it, I'll go to, I'm a cop and I'm being bombarded with all these things. And all I'm trying to do is help this one person who doesn't want help. How do I do that? And it literally, I got, I'm telling you, it came down to, and I never thought it would be true. We got to keep him alive for at least one more night. I had seen the mother die from abusing pills and alcohol. Youngest brother shot and killed by crack cocaine. Oldest brother overdosed on heroin and fentanyl. The last of the brother, we tried everything we could to save him. And he says, no, I don't want help. What do I do? We kept him alive for 24 more hours. He went home and did what was left. So I'm telling you, it's a lot more complex than to say that I have all the answers. I can walk into a particular community and fix it all. I can take someone to jail and it fixes it all. I can get them social services and it fixes it all. Um, it is extremely challenging. Man, that, that had a huge impact. It changed me professionally and personally. I went through my own struggles with that. Um, but it wasn't, what do I do when someone doesn't want the help and I don't have the tools to deal with this? And again, I, I stand up for law enforcement in the aspect of we're being asked to do an awful lot that we don't have the tools and resources for. And Gabriel, you pointed this out to me. It takes more than your compassion and empathy. You're right. It does. Wh where do I get the tools to fix it? 
It's a, a good lot. question. A We're going to have to go back and forth on that and continue this conversation, right? Yeah, it's a lot. I'm going to address uh, one or two more questions because yeah. we're over that five o'clock time and I want to be respectful of yours. I got a question here asking because, yeah. you know, I'm a policy person. Yeah. Uh, ask the chief, does he have a policy on racial slurs? Lexapol does our policies, and I, I think it is. I'd have to look. I don't know for certain, but I I'm, think we do. Um, and there's something we can do from overall conduct and ethics. Okay. Um, I know this is one of the questions the center asked, and it got into a lot of discussion when with the chiefs, because the question was, would I fire somebody if they used a racial slur? or if they did X, Y, Z. And my answer, simple answer was, well, yes, I'd like to do that, but I'm not part of a union and they have certain rights. I have to follow certain laws, especially being a small community that the officer has rights to. And as much as I would want to do that, they have the right to appeal it. Would I take that action? Absolutely. But if that, if there was a union involved and I got involved or if the court stepped in, I, I people would come back and go, well, you didn't fix the problem. Well, no, I wanted to do this, but this person, I didn't follow progressive discipline. I did something wrong, something along that line. So that becomes challenging. So the short answer is yes. Would I want to do that? Absolutely. Would it necessarily work out that way? It depends on the law, the court and appeals and if they're a union or not union. Got it. And this final one for you, um, since uh, you have focused a lot on addiction in your mm -hmm. time, Ask the chief, since there's a coalition on opioids, should there be one for crack slash marijuana? It, it's actually an addiction response coalition, so it's everything. And I was just having a conversation with an officer today at lunch, and we were talking about crack back in the 80s, and, and I wasn't in the position I'm in now, but I got to say that it, I wish we changed, because I know a lot of people think that we didn't do this for crack in the 80s and law enforcement. The reason why we changed for opioids was because it was the white community being hit the hardest. And I tell people, I wish it was, I was so noble that I could say that I recognized in the group and everyone recognized that um, during the crack cocaine days, the black community was hit harder. It was unfair. They weren't treated equal. I wish I could be that noble, but it wasn't. It was numbers. It was 50 to 70 over people overdosing every single week, nearly 200 in a, in a week, 40 a day. The Hamlin County Justice Center was processing nearly 10,000 people a year just on heroin related issues alone. It was the numbers that forced us to change. And that's sad to say. Again, I wish it was some noble purpose that I could sit there and have so much insight and recognize the wrongs of history and then come back and tell everybody, man, I'm writing the wrongs of history. But it wasn't. It was the numbers were so overwhelming. I will say this. This is the only silver lining when it comes to fentanyl and the overdoses. It forced us to no longer ignore the inequities. It forced us to look at drug issues as a chronic mental medical health condition. It forced some of us, some of us to stand up and say, what has been happening in the past is wrong and we need to change it. If anything, it took all these issues of race, poverty, homelessness, work, transportation, community, and it was all bubbling on the surface. And if there's anything that fentanyl did that was good, which is hard to find because so many people are dying, it bubbled all those issues up to where we couldn't ignore them, we couldn't sweep them under the rug, and we couldn't just brush them aside. And now at least we had to start having those conversations and talking about it. So, and I, I think hopefully we right some wrongs from the past, but it wasn't anything noble. It was the numbers that we couldn't ignore it. I, I'm sorry, Chief. I, I, I like it, but I, I'm going to have to fold my arms and say, I "Here can't. we go." I was waiting and for it. it. Was not connected. We we're both going to the same space. I can see it. I can see whatever happens. The court I mean, I can, docket I still see exploded it. in the right. '80s and '90s with the crack epidemic. Exploded. So overdosing and dying because well, the, the, it, there was well, 12, there were so many lateral consequences of the crack epidemic in Correct. the communities that the jails that's when our as you know well that the that that our um prison industrial complex exploded as well and so yep. the, the the financial impact on the nation 
not only on the communities with the numbers of people that were going out of those systems. I mean, so no, there weren't as many people who were overdosing and dying. However, right. there were a lot more people who were killing because yes. of crack related territorial wars. And there right. were so many more people who were going to jail and there were so many more families that were being devastated. I mean, right. the, the, the lateral impacts of crack particularly, and the demographic was black folks, was was just as great, if not greater, than the heroin and people dying on, on overdose. I, I'm going to fold my arms and say, all right, Chief, I agree with you on that. I'm saying, but on that one, I, I'm sorry, Chief. I can't, I can't go with you on that one. I agree and just looking at the of- sentencing disparity between crack yeah. and yeah. crack cocaine, right? I mean, that's kind of a tip of, the, tip of the hat, so to speak. You were about to say something, Chief? I agree with you 100%. But here's the other thing that ended up happening with this epidemic with so many people overdosing and dying was if you go back to the cocaine crack days, and I'm not going to be 100 percent, but it was around 10 to 12,000 dying. Here it's uh, around 60 to 70,000 Americans dying. But here's what else happened. Fanon, to your point about the prison system being so expansive is now you have both sides of the party, Republican and Democrats, who are saying this isn't working. We're not going to expand this anymore. You all need to figure out something different. You're right. Do I wish it would have been done back then? I 100% wish. I think you can look back and say there's so much that was done wrong. How do we make it right? It will never go back and fix the wrongs, but at least we can go back and change the future. No, I agree with you 100%. Those are the issues. And the other part of it too, the drug trade itself changed. When you had gangs controlling it, you could go out as far as law enforcement, pick out the head person, you cut the head off the snake, the snake collapses. There was a lot of shootings and violence with gay politicians, the ability to say, well, look at all these people that are killing each other. Everyone's shooting one another. It's territorial. Let's do zero tolerance on crime. We've learned zero tolerance in, in crime, zero tolerance in school. None of that works. Um, I think if anything, there's been lessons learned, and I'm not discounting anything that you said. It is more of those lessons, I think, in some cases have been learned. Still a long way to go. And the cocaine and crack disparity, I, I don't understand that whatsoever. And I've signed off as being one of the people in support of changing that. It should have never been that. Um, I, there's no way to dispute that or even put a debate to that. All right. Well, to be respectful of everyone's time, since this was scheduled from four to five, and like Fanon said, we could probably go another eight hours to go ahead and wrap it up but you know we touched a lot of issues today from addiction response to oversight boards transparency accountability community collaboration community and police relationships and so on and so forth and i just want people to know that this is only the beginning of these types of conversations that we're going to be having like this so as we close out i hope that people recognize that a lot of work has been done but there's still a lot of work to do um and with that I also want to go ahead and thank again Philip and Gail Holloman for their gift, the president and CEO of the Urban League, uh, Christy Coons. And I want to thank the team at the Center for Social Justice. So we'll start with Kendra Reeves. She's our senior data and analytics. Um, Jasmine Cosen, vice president of advocacy, community, and strategic relations. Kevin Thompson for helping with this show. He's the administrative assistant at CSJ. Sherry Boone helping with uh, social media. And our newest member, Nia Thomas, who is our manager of social justice advocacy, has been doing pretty good work, even just stepping in the doors just for one week has already helped produce some things and has helped on this show. And of course, thank you for being around and being here, Fanon, senior advisor to myself. And finally, if you need to reach out to us, you can do so at CS, you see, CSJ at ulgso.org and then let me grab this number or you can call 513-487-6534 and why would people call the center for social justice all right that's where we're about to get to you would be giving us a call if you're having any sort of issues or have something that you need to discuss with policing and then we can sit down and talk you through or have a conversation with you and potentially even have a conversation with the department and folks like Chief Signing to either work through some sort of issue or point you in the right direction. And then Fanon, if you don't have anything, I'm gonna go ahead and tell everyone 
have a great day. And Chief, thank you for being here and thank you for being our first guest. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you guys. And thanks for the Center for Social Justice. Thanks for what you're doing in the collaborations. And, and on a personal note, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate the discussion. I always walk away thinking I, and I look at things from a different perspective. So I am honored that you guys had me as the first guest. I'm honored to be a friend of yours. And thank you for all that you're doing for us. And thanks to the Center for, for working with us and collaborating. Thank you. And with that, see you later, everyone. We appreciate you being here.